All right, welcome to Deeply Rooted. Uh, we're getting we're back together uh, to go through Virtuous, our book by Nancy Wilson. We're in Chapter Seven, which is about humility. And so let's just jump right in. Deb, I think you had some great definitions, right? Yes. So humility is being free from pride and not t uh, thinking of yourself. It is realizing your talents and gifts are from God, uh, putting your worth in him, admitting you can never live up to his holiness and perfection, um, and seeing how much you need him and asking for his help. Awesome. I had written in, just penciled in my book, Humility is confidence in Christ alone, and humility is a right perspective of our smallness in light of God's bigness. Yeah, you know, in our woman's study uh, for this particular week, that was a point of um, of rightly understanding who God is, right? The Creator, the King, yeah, um, God, and and who we are. What my place, little peons, in just him. Yeah, yeah. We're the created. Yes, and so just acknowledging um, him for who he is and understanding our position in him. That right, just that alone should bring some humility to us. I tell you what, it's actually been one of those things just to ponder on that, to meditate on that um, this week has been so fruitful for me um, as far as just to really just basking in, in the greatness of God and the smallness of his of us. Right. And then yet um, that just points us right back to his grace and the the incredible model that Christ has been for us and is for us. Should we jump into that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so on page 51 of chapter, uh, this is chapter 7, page 51, Nancy opens up with um, with explaining, you know, no list of Christian virtues can be complete without humility. This is a central part of the gospel, so it is central to the Christian life. And she points us right to Jesus, you know, how Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on a cross um, and points us back to Philippians. Is that where you're at, Deb? Is that where you wanted to go or? Yeah, sure. Okay, well, you know, she just, um, she had cited Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ uh, Jesus. We follow our humble Savior when we humble ourselves. And then she went into Philippians 2, 8 through 11, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Je Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah, so Christ is the example of the humble servant. Um, and I just was thinking about this as far as... Um, humility versus pride which we're going to get into but our nature yeah is self-focus and yet as believers um we are trying to submit and surrender to our focus being solely god i mean we live in a world where we're tempted to focus on making the best name for ourselves pushing our own plans mm -hmm. with a self-first attitude and approach but jesus displays a different um, focus that is being a servant in this world, the perfect, the perfect example of putting others' needs above our own. Um, with a picture of Jesus on the cross, that is the example of humility. Well, you know, you think about it. I mean, God um, constraining Himself to flesh and blood. Um, you know, the God of all of all creation to re to be reduced to flesh and blood. That was mass. I mean, that was the big humility right there. And then. Um, you think about, you know, washing the the disciples' feet, you know, and that, that act of um, service and humility there. Obvi obviously, you know, death on the cross, to be tortured, to be beaten, to be, um, you know, just through immense mockery and suffering, uh, the humility that he demonstrated. But his all of it pointed towards something bigger. You know, it wasn't just about torture or suffering there was there was a goal there was fruit uh and um and I, it's just it's overwhelming yeah really. you, we were talking before we turned on this um audio recap and we were talking about love yeah and so pointing to the greatest love 
right. the greatest example of love. And and Eileen, you want to share a little bit about what we were talking about with, our- with the the fruit? Yeah. 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 You know, we talk about, you know, um, oh, my goodness, uh, the fruit of the spirit. Wait, no, we're, it wasn't the fruit of the spirit. Um, it was... Uh, uh, was it uh, Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians 13 that we were talking about? I think, I'm um, sorry, we were kind of all over the place. And you guys, I'm just going to give you a heads up right now. I cracked my neck and I have the weirdest, uh, most unpleasant headache right now. And so I just, not to offer excuses or anything, but I'm just not on my A game at the moment. Uh, talking but the- about love that... Um- has many different facets. Yeah. And so actually, yeah, it was um, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 4. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. Um, love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Oh, and then we were also talking about the fruits of the Spirit, I recall now. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I just changed it on the fly with us. But really, we were describing love as having many facets, many expressions of love. And when we were talking about the fruit of the Spirit, um, love, kindness, hope, joy, um, peace, long suffering, um, all the different fruits. If we were to, instead of considering it like a fruit basket with a variety of fruits, let's say the one fruit is the love and the love looks, has many different descriptors. Um, if we were to kind of reconsider it in that light, um, it really kind of shapes things differently and the application differently. And so if we consider humility as an expression of love, uh, and that's what Christ demonstrated for us. Uh, this is one of the many aspects or facets of love that he expressed to us. So that was kind of it in a, in a nutshell. Um, later, actually, we got into a little bit of the different aspects or descriptors of humility. But I don't want to jump into that one too too soon yet. I think that was a little further on in the chapter. So, you know, funny thing, though, I mean, everything that we just described, if we were to flip a couple pages forward in our book, we have our list of questions at the end of the chapter. How does Christ set the standard for humility? I, I think we just answered that right there. Yes. So sacrificial, um, humbling, self-humbling love for the glory of God um, and for the, the salvation um, of his people. So do you want to move forward? Yeah. Um, on page 52, a humble mindset. And um, again, Jesus being our, our model for humility, he laid down the privileges of his status as the son of God. He humbled himself and became a man so that he could die for his church. He obeyed God, even to going to a shameful death on a cross. This is our model for humility. And um, I think we we were also talking about humility just being not our natural tendency. (laughs) You know, our natural tendency is really for self-exaltation and pride. Oh, sorry. Did you, I thought you had some stuff on that. Yeah. Well, let's go down a little bit further. Keep reading on there. Oh, okay. Um, I'll just, uh, humility is not easy. We exaggerate our own importance. We see the defects and shortcomings of others. Basically, pride is the enemy of humility. And then uh, the further down here, where she kind of gets into how do we seek humility, but we are called to humility and we're uh, to seek it and find it. Where do we look for humility? We look to the author of humility, God himself. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. That's Zephaniah 2, 3. And then... um, I think we actually found that kind of points us back to question number two as well. Why does our flesh have such a hard time? Again, uh, page 58, sorry. Question number two, why does our flesh have such a hard time being humble? Well, it's because we naturally tend to exalt ourselves. Um, We think more of ourselves, um, that we're better. Uh, we look out for our personal interest instead of others. So there's a self-focus. There's a pride, and it's sin in me, basically. We're born with an innate desire to be prideful. Um, and as believers, we must fight against this with truth and putting hands and feet to it. Um, it's picking up picking up the Bible, being in the Word daily, and being surrendered to the Lord to ask Him how to to walk in a manner that's worthy of this calling, um, you know, and 
again, he's the one that does all of this. It's right. not us, you know, right. anything done in our own efforts, it's not going to be lasting. Um, it will fail. And so as we, we continue to go through these different virtues, just remember that this is a surrendering of ourselves and our desires and, and asking him to, to do this work in us. Um, we talked the past couple of weeks about asking yeah. the Lord to do these things. They don't happen by chance. I was talking with another sister and um, just trying to encourage her to be in the word, to be looking at these different virtues, um, but to ask yeah. um, of the Lord. And so he doesn't just grant us things and change us. There must be a recognition um, of what our need is right? and um, and a surrendering of the heart to actually wait for him to receive those things that he wants to do in us. Well, you know, I think it would be interesting to talk about a little bit about false humility. Um, you know, a lot of times... I think a person can confuse like, oh, I get embarrassed um, easily or I'm so shy. Um, that's humility, you know, or, or even people might think that behaving in that way, like that exhibits shyness or uh, even embarrassment, um, that that would be a good demonstration of, of humility. Um, but I would actually argue that that's a that's actually a demonstration of a false humility. Um, you know, if you're if it's about embarrassment, really, um, it's not about being humble in light of who, of God's bigness. It's a it's a fear of being exposed um, that you're not as um, as good or as great as you might hope others to view you. Um, Ephesians five twenty nine says, um, this is Paul's letter to the Ephesians, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. And I, I just think about that, you know, as far as the humility goes, like, do we really, um, do we really just try to neglect ourselves or hate our own flesh? Like our natural tendency is self-preservation, is self-care, you know, we all hear about this all the time. Um, you know, and, and to, to really kind of pamper ourselves. Um, I had actually written down Isaiah six, um, and it was Isaiah six. I believe I wrote down five through eight. Um, and this is Isaiah's vision. Um, then I said, woe to me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I have, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from um, the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and with it said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away and atonement is made for your sin. And then we see um, Isaiah, just the glory. The glory comes right after that. But really... um, with, with his understanding, his crying out, woe to me, for I am ruined. Uh, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. That's humility. He is recognizing how sinful, how small, how um, insignificant he is in light of the king of glory. And then I, I also was thinking about Job, um, chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. And uh, let's see, he says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her guilt has been removed, that she has received the Lord's hand, double for all her sins. The voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let the uneven ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has, um, has spoken. And I think, okay, that's it right there. Laid low, um, you know, uh, the make, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. And it's all about God's glory. It's nothing about, you know, everybody look at me, look at me, 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 me. Like that is, that is the antithesis. Uh, right. humility right yeah at the bottom of page 52 it says humble is a verb yeah it says jesus told us the way up is down 
For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's Luke 14, 11. So it is better to humble ourselves than to be humbled by God. Oh, yes. Yes, and amen to that. You Less know. painful <laughs> by far. <laughs> Typically, it starts internally. Yes. There's an internal work that happens, an internal fruit. Right. And then it says, when we are humbled by someone else, it is humiliating. And we are not called to humble others. We are called to humble ourselves. So <clears throat> this focus must be first towards the Lord. Yeah. And yeah. asking him to do that work in us, whatever it is that... Right. Um, Maybe there's different areas of our lives that need to be humbled. I'm I'm sure there is, and I'm sure yeah. there's different seasons for different things. But, you know, how often do we look at others? How often? Oh, it's, it's way more comfortable it's, to look at other yeah, people's dirty easy. stuff than your own. Absolutely. Um, but uh, we are not called to do that, actually. Well, and I, I, I can't help but consider, you know, previous conversations that we've had. I think we've even recorded here as far as... Um, confession of sin, you know, recognizing the sin, confessing it, repenting of it. Um, those are all elements of being humbled um, and humbling oneself before God. Now, we can either be um, humiliated by others um, or humbled by by our God, but we can also be, um, there is that op opportunity to to just come to the Lord in, in confession and in submission and repentance. And, you know, I can't help but think of, of Sunday mornings, you know, taking that time before the Lord and, um, you know, whether you kneel physically or, or, or maybe it's just a private thing between you and the Lord, but to confess and to repent and to have that assurance of God's forgiveness. Um, what a beautiful humbling that is. And I had written a little note to myself here, you know, um, self humbling, um, is better than being humiliated. <laughs> like, I know that's like, duh, obvious, but I like writing obvious things down sometimes, you know, and the difference between internal, it starts internally that way, as opposed to the humiliation typically starts externally. And it's typically pretty public, um, which led me to my last observation on that was um, to be humbled by God or to to come to him in in a humble repentance is to be covered by his grace in that. Um, but to be humiliated, whether by the public or however that might come about, is really to be exposed um, and to, to, to remain under the covering um, of God is obviously what we should choose and should want to be where we should want to be. Right. She says down at the bottom of page 53, to humble yourself is to get under God's feet. Um, you acknowledge that he is Lord and you are not. You confess your sins and thank him for his forgiveness. You submit to his authority over you. This is humility before God. Right. And, you know, back up on 53, it says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's Matthew 18, 4. Um, there is a trust and a vulnerability. Yeah. Um, and we're looking at this as a, as a parent and ultimately God is our father. And right. So <clears throat> this is a, a trust that we have, um, before him and it takes being vulnerable. Well, you know, um, I had made a comment um, when we met with the ladies uh, for our discussion about the freedom that comes out of humility. And I try not to get into next week's chapter. Next week, we're talking about courage and we see glimmers of that here, but I'm trying really hard not to jump into it too much. Um, but the freedom of resting in God and just being small in his big hand, um, <laughs> that's the ultimate freedom. Uh, truly to to just be abiding in Christ, um, we we don't have to be encumbered. We don't have to be burdened um, in the in the way of fighting, um, fighting for our own will, fighting for our pride, fighting for what we want, which funny enough kind of leads us to some of the, the questions that we're going to have to or that we're led to next, because I think question number three is on page uh, 58. Why does God love the humble? And um why does God love the humble? What What do you have on that? Well, it says on page 53, God loves the humble in spirit. He exalts, lifts up, and gives more grace to the humble hearted. So we should want to get a humble spirit. 
but how do we get a humble spirit? Um, so she says, I already mentioned that it's not easy and it's not natural, but we must be able to do it because we are commanded to humble ourselves. Yeah. Um, and uh, I actually had put for why does God love the humble? Um, if we walk in humility, it truly shows that we recognize God. Um, Jesus for who he is. It shows that we know who we are in Christ. It shows we trust him and are submitted to him and that we are walking in obedience. And this is what is pleasing to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you think about all the fruit of obedience, but really ultimately it comes down to when we are walking in humility, when we have a right view of ourself again, in light of God, um, we're not, um, fighting him for the glory. We're not pushing. I mean, as if as if there's any um, point to a fight with God anyways, we already know who wins, who loses in that one. Um, but, you know, th th the reason God loves it is because it points to his glory. Right. It is fruitful and it points to his glory. And, you know, uh, again, it's pleasing to him. Yeah. How, do, how much do you want to please your earthly father? Right. Um, or mother or um, husband, uh, the, all the, the ones more. that we love. Yeah. All the more. I, I want to please my heavenly father. Yeah. Yeah. Um, page 54, we're getting into God blessing the humble. Um, Psalm 25, nine says the humble, he guides in justice and the humble, he teaches his way. And then Proverbs 22, four by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Psalm 147, six says the Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. And um, I had written down on here um, the last line of that paragraph. I loved it. Uh, the humble are in the position, a lowly position, to receive great good from their loving God. And I had written a little note that by his strength, um, we we lean into his strength. Humility leans into his strength. Uh, it's not by our might, not by our will or our power, um, but it's pressing into him and leaning on him completely. Yeah, I mean, these things are given by the Lord, but only to the humble. Yeah. And don't think that blessings come to those that are proud or those left to their own devices. Oh, no. God talks about what he does with the proud, doesn't he? <laughs> we are going to look at that, actually. Um, what was question, f oh, uh, question, question four? four. Uh, what is the benefit of humility? Um, oh, and that's, I think, where I, I had written down about Ephesians, what we kind of talked about before you know, the different elements there, but really the benefit, um, of humility is the blessing is walking in the blessing. This is not fighting against the blessing uh, that God would, would so willingly, so eagerly pour out. Right. And, and in that he says he, he will guide us. He teaches us. Um, and we're able to receive that we're able to, to hear from him mm -hmm. and, um, it says the honors and riches are given and they, he lifts us up. Um, and we'll have the peace of God, knowing that we are walking in obedience. Right, right. Well, then uh, the next section that we're getting into, um, I really enjoyed this section quite a bit because this is where we get to the hands and feet. Uh, like we always like to say, okay, what's it look like with hands and feet and a mouth? Um, and here on page 54, but how are we to be humble toward others? And she opens up with a verse of Romans twelve sixteen. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do, do not be wise in your own opinion. And humility is willing to get along with others, having the same mind. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, can, can you get along with people that think differently than you? <laughs> do you have to be the one? Do you always have to be right? Um, do you always have to win or, you know, be heard more than hearing others? Um, and we, we have the truth of God. We know the truth of God. Um, but we also know the difference between being um, agreeable and getting along towards unity and just being a thorn. Right. And and this doesn't say, um, this doesn't talk about getting along with just believers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's not trying to show off or display its own talents or abilities, but chooses lowly, humble people. Humility never sees itself as wise. I like this part because she said, the odd thing is that uh, wise people see how far they still have to go, but the foolish think they're already wise. And that takes some um, 
just surrendering of self and yeah. self focus and what we think that high lofty mindset that uh, yeah we're right in all of our decisions and our thoughts. So um, that's definitely the way to do that is to be focused on the Lord. It's to be focused on the things that are truth and the things that are above and regarding His truth, His words, um, first yeah. and foremost. So in every situation, yeah. in every conversation, and and in everything that we do. Um, we'll have a better shot yeah. at walking in obedience and having um, humility. Should yeah, this should sh this should alter the light, like the the lens that we view all things through. Yeah. You know, um, every interaction, every conversation, every everything should be viewed through this lens. I like that um, Nancy actually gave us ten points to go through. Um, as far as um, humility and, and what it looks like, you know, point number one was humility has a high view of God and a low view of itself. And that's why I keep saying, you know, uh, it's recognizing how small you are in light of God's bigness. Right. Right. Number two is humility is obedient. This means a student obeys her teacher. A daughter obeys her parents. A wife obeys her husband. A worker obeys her boss. A church member obeys the elders. A citizen obeys the speed limit <laughs> and pays her taxes. Well, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> but my kingdom's not of this world. I have to pay my taxes? No. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, it's not my kingdom anyway. So I was just there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and to, um, just on a little note there, have you noticed how many of these virtues keep pointing back to obedience? I mean wisdom, all of them really keep coming back. Diligence, all of it goes back to obedience. It's a determination. Um, it's a, it's not uh, an accidental thing. Um, point number three, the humble are eager for good works. And if you think about this, most good works benefit others. I am eager to help others because I am already eager to help myself. Yep. <laughs> And number four, humility has a wise and tender-hearted tongue, so it doesn't bad mouth others. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, truth with no grace is cruel. So, well, I was just thinking about you know, humility doesn't lash out. Right. Humility doesn't vent um, for itself. You know, for I mean, it doesn't vent, but um, venting, you know, is all about your own relief, your own you know, vindication or feeling good or whatever. At least self-focus. Yeah, it's all about you. Um, but, uh, and then to be tender-hearted, that's an interesting one as well. You know, tender-hearted tongue. The tongue is so powerful. Um, you know, it can be murder, it can be life. Uh, let's see here. Number five, humility is not argumentative for the sake of arguing. It is eager to get along with others. And I mean, I think at, at times, Gosh, probably all of us have been just argumentative. Like I think about being a teenager and just, you know, always picking arguments. Yeah. Um, but then as we grow older, we can still do the same. Do we always have to have the last word? Do we always have to, um, you know, get everybody to yield? <laughs> That's right. Is your mindset, I'm eager to get along with this person instead of, no, I want to put my point across. Or even like <laughs> always playing the devil's advocate you know, in a conversation, like, is that, is that always necessary? I mean, there's certain things about looking at a, at, at all the perspectives or trying to look at something with wisdom. Um, but you know, are we the negative, um, the negative Nancy that's always just trying to kind of stir the pot. Right. Going on to six, humility is gentle and courteous. She is compassionate and kindly. I do, I do like how humility and gentleness really seem to work hand in hand. Uh, I noticed that in the scriptures as I was going through many of these Psalms and Proverbs and, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, and even Job. Um, but uh, gentleness and courteousness, uh, courteous, how is courteousness different than gentleness? That's kind of on the fly. I'm just thinking out loud about that one. I mean, because like, I think um, courteousness, I think of like politeness, right? Um, you know, and um, maybe knowing how to behave in a situation, you know, um, like appropriateness. Um, but then gentleness is, uh, I also think about like grace, you know, maybe being even, even graceful, um, graceful with your words, graceful with your thoughts. Um, number seven, humility listens and is teachable. That's a big one. Yeah. 
that's just, uh, yeah, we, we need to be teachable. You know, so we, I think we should always go into an, a situation, a conversation, whatever it is, and um, be willing to consider the possibility that we're wrong. <laughs> I that we have something to learn. <laughs> I am not in that mindset. <laughs> when I am having a um, a a, a happy conversation <laughs> with my spouse, most of the time, uh -oh. it's not. How can I be taught right now? Oh gosh! So that would be the pride this yeah. in my heart. Uh, yeah, and by not wanting to listen, by not wanting to be taught something, but really wanting to get my point across. And again, yeah. that goes back to let's just label it sin. Yeah, it's pride. It's sin. It's sin. You know, I love it. Um, I know. Well, I don't love it. Like in the moment, to just call the ugly thing what it really is. You know, to identify the sin biblically, but. That's where it's at. Yeah. You know, in fact, while we're there, um, we've got a couple more here. Yeah, yeah. But um, that's okay. We're going to go to how God hates pride. But since we're there at the moment, let, let's let look at um, pride. And um, it's, a, it's an ambitious, exalted man. And he acts self-sufficient. He may not be self-sufficient, but if he is going to be, if he's going to exalt himself, um, he is forced to act in a certain manner. It's He's going to act in control, in charge, very capable, independent, and a, he's above others. These, yeah. these are the exalted, prideful man. Um, the great problem with being self-sufficient is that a person feels he does not even need God in his life. He may be religious, but he does not live a changed life that demonstrates a true trust and dependency upon God for salvation and life. He corrupts morality and justice. The man who exalts himself governs all things by whatever moves him ahead and gives him the greatest position and recognition. True morality and justice may be thought about, but they are set aside as if needed. The ambitious man who exalts himself often has to lie, steal, cheat, abuse, ridicule, shame, um, not give due recognition. Hold, holds others back or down and hurts, damages, and even kills. His life is a life of struggle. Hmm. So, you know, I feel like anybody that just listened to that, I mean, myself right now, um, I can't help but listen to that and just feel a bit of grief yeah. and a bit of shame as we rec as I can recognize those traits in myself Absolutely. at different times and and that should cause grief that should cause a sadness um but also an immense gratitude um for God's grace um yes. wow right cuz i mean as looking at it those things what they breed is a life of struggle yeah it breeds um that this person will be displaced um They'll find all other seats and positions already taken in life. They'll have to take the lowest seat um, and he'll be embarrassed and shamed uh, by being de debased. So uh, wow. there's many, I mean, there's even more things that oh, yeah, on and on about, but um, let's see what it says here. Uh, what do you want to do? Oh, are we continuing our little list let's, here? Let's let's continue on with our list, and then because we're going to get more to about how God, God hates. Oh them. yeah, yeah. So okay, so we were on number eight, I think, right? Yeah. Okay, number eight. Humility seeks forgiveness for sin and puts things right with others. And like as you were reading that list, it's like, oh my goodness. Um, can we humble ourselves and either um, forgive or or seek forgiveness? Um, regardless of how, however, whichever direction that sin started in, can we humble ourselves and seek forgiveness uh, for either party, for ourselves or for the other, and uh, and make things right? Right. How often do we want to? <laughs> excuse me. How often do we want to set our way? Yeah. Um, make our stance, be a defense, um, state our cause or our issues. And, you know, for me yeah. personally, I want the Lord to work this in me so much, you know, and we can't do it on our own. Right. So therefore we have to ask, we must 
ask if we really want this. You know, I've been, um, I, I am kind of ashamed to admit it, but I am one of those, I'm not a subtle person. Everybody who knows me knows I'm not subtle um, pretty much in any way. But um, there have been times where um, somebody has wronged me, somebody has done something, and I wanted to make it very clear that we are not okay. In fact, I wanted them to know how not okay we were um, as if my disapproval of them would lead them to repentance, um, as if as if they would know that uh, every time they saw me, they would be reminded of this terrible thing, and that would draw them to repentance. And oh, Lord, forgive me for that, um, for that, um, that wrong perspective, that wrong attitude. And then, um, you know, this has been a honestly, it's been it's been a wonderful thing. I'm so grateful that the Lord has given me a, a much has straightened that out uh, in my mind and my heart. Um, but then that's also led to those, okay, now there's an act of obedience. So I've made these things clear. I've made made it clear to people um, in the past, you know, and now am I going to, am I going to be obedient towards reconciliation, towards forgiveness and restoration? And then the repentance also uh, on my part for taking on a role that was not mine to take. Uh, it's it should never be our own disapproval or frustration or anger that leads one to repentance. Yeah. So um, moving on to nine, yeah. humility gives way to others, serving others first, giving others the best seat or the biggest piece of pie. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> I used to know someone that would cut the tops off of muffins. And they would eat the best part of the muffin, the top of the muffin, and give everybody else the bottoms of the muffin. Wow. And I just, and it's so funny, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Like, give them the top part of the muffin. It's the best part. <laughs> See, naturally, we're very self-focused. Everybody knows the top part's the best part. We all want to eat the, <laughs> the top part. Yeah, but share the top part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number 10. <laughs> Finally, humility is to be exhibited toward everyone, not just those in authority over us. And not just those you deem um, necessary to receive it. <laughs> yeah. It says everyone. You know, my first thought was actually kids in this one. Um, you know, how are we towards our children? You know, um, for me, you know, I've got little kids in the house. And um, how do I how do I exhibit humility towards my kids? And really, again, it's that right perspective. Um, any leadership or any does any instruction that I'm giving, it's it's because God has called me to do that. Um, my my um, discipling of my kids or instruction of my kids is my act of obedience unto the Lord, and they need to know that. They need to know, you know, if it's just because Mom wants it this way, you know, right. Um, it's, it's much deeper than that. Right. So this is where we get to where God hates pride. Oh, dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> it says the opposite of humility is pride. This is most easily identified as feeling overly pleased with ourselves. <laughs> pride is a blinding and hardening sin. Yeah. The more we indulge it, the worse it gets says these six things the lord hates yes seven are an abomination to him and it starts off with a proud look so if we go to proverbs six sixteen, really she kind of shares through um proverbs um oh was that six sixteen that you just read because yeah, and then she goes to teen proverbs uh 16 18 through 19 yeah so it's a little it's like a tongue tie here yeah um pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud and then uh she also goes into she's got a couple more here psalm 101 um five whoever secretly slanders his neighbor him i will destroy the one who has a haughty look and a proud heart him i will not endure and then Proverbs twenty eight twenty five, he who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord uh, will be prospered. Wow. God hates pride and pride is the herald for destruction and a fall. We should hate pride every time we see it in ourselves. And I just, I wrote down uh, in my, my book here, I was like, do I hate what God hates? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, so often we talk about 
you know, especially with a book like Virtuous, you know, we're talking about cultivating um, godly biblical virtues, um, but there is actually a biblical virtue of hatred, um, and it is to hate the things that God hates. Right. He, uh, when he talks about seven things the Lord hates, this hate is abomination. Um, it's it's said in Proverbs 6, 16 through 17, this abomination, this is the Bible's strongest progression of hatred for wickedness. Wow. The last is most prominent. It is causing discord against the brethren. And that's in Proverbs 6, 16 through 17a. Wow. So, <laughs> right, it leads to one's downfall. And it's so despicable that a person should avoid it, even if it means being economically oppressed. That's in Proverbs 16, 18 through 19. So. Well, then uh, kind of moving forward, um, the last question in, in this chapter is how can we identify pride in ourselves? And on page 57, Nancy kind of writes out a bit of a litmus for us that's really helpful. Um, so how do we know if we are proud, number one, the proud slander others passing on lies? And two, the proud look down on others, considering themselves to be better. Three, the proud love to stir up trouble, causing quarrels. Four, the proud react to pride in others. Who does she think she is? <laughs> Number five, a proud spirit does not receive correction. Do you argue when you're confronted with the, with a mistake or sin? Mm, I, I have to say I have failed in that area. Absolutely. There's uh, oftentimes a bit of pushback from myself as well. Right. You know, with all these things that we're looking at here, um, and it's not just this week, unless we remember these things that we're talking about and discussing, and we actually purpose to remember that and then ask the Lord to do this work in us, yeah, um, this is worth nothing. We so. must look to apply these things. Okay. So when with this week, if somebody approaches you about something that maybe you messed up, maybe you could have done better, maybe it was an outright sin, how are you going to respond? Right. Do we respond by justifying it or by trying to n negotiate? Um, or do we say, oh my, thank you. Thank you. And take it, learn from it and move on. Right. And that would be a perfect example of humility. Oh. So the first thing in your mind pops up when you are confronted is all the reasons that they are wrong. <laughs> yeah. I would suggest, um, maybe trying to change your mindset and saying quietly while they're talking to you, Lord. Where am I wrong in this? Well, and then just knowing how easy it is for us to justify our oh, sin. I mean, we're very good at it. Yeah. So number six, a proud spirit does not take trouble for others. Wait. Yeah. A proud spirit does not take trouble for others. So it doesn't take concern for others. Right. It wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go that extra mile. Wouldn't break a sweat for somebody else's need. Um, let's see here. Finally, the humble love to hear God's praises. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. That's Psalm 34, 1 through 2. The humble gather to worship God and rejoice to praise him. Yes and amen. I want to do those things. So um, just a little bit extra. Um, just thinking about humility, um, I just want to give you five things. Oh, okay. Um, first, Get your pencils. First, to walk as a servant to others, always ready and willing to help. Second would be to behave in an unassuming manner, not be showy or pretentious, prideful or haughty or arrogant or assertive. Number three, to assume a spirit of lowliness, and submission of oneness and identification with others, not showing conceit or superiority. And then we have four, to possess a sense of lowliness and unworthiness, to have a modest opinion of oneself, knowing that others are just as significant and valuable. And five, to come to God on a regular basis, and confess one's spiritual need and unworthiness. And you can look at James 4, 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Mm. And then we have um, results, the results of humility, and they are threefold. 
One, the humble man will be acknowledged. Both men and God will notice his spirit and energy in serving others, no matter how lowly his position. His putting others first, whether person, project, work, or company, will not go unnoticed for long. His dedication to serving and working and helping others will be seen and acknowledged. Two, the humble man will be rewarded. He will be approached and his presence, energy, and effort will be desired and promoted and placed where he can serve to the maximum. And then three, the humble man will be honored by all. He will have lived to serve and help others. Therefore, when he is exalted, all will rejoice with him. Um, so these are just different results of humility. Not that we look for mm -hmm. these things, not to be acknowledged. Yeah. But these are actually things that happen um, when we are walking in true humility. So, okay, a little a little conversation on this one afterwards that I'd love to explore with you a little bit. Because I think, like I was touching on before, there can be some misunderstandings as far as what humility looks like or is. You know, um, there are many who might think um, walking with a sense of embarrassment or... Um, even even like an anxiety, like a nervousness, um, more not anxiety, like a nervousness or uh, insecurity might be how you exhibit. Um, they might think that's how you exhibit humility, but it's it's more of a false humility. Like you were talking about the shyness. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I'd love to talk about with you um, is how what about humility and confidence combined? What you know, what does that look like? And how is that a, a godly attribute? Because, you know, um, just because you see a, a speaker um, speaking boldly or confidently, does that mean that they, they're not humble? And I, I, I mean, obviously not. Um, like we think about the Sermon on the Mount or we think about, um, you know, the Apostle Paul or, you know, any of the disciples that, that went and spoke boldly. I think about John the Baptist, you know, was bold and said hard things, strong things um, that wasn't lacking humility to do those things. And sometimes we might think, OK, so walking out with a certain amount of confidence can be a lack of humility. But when that confidence is rightly placed, when we understand that it's not about ourselves, um, then, then that's confidence and humility in a proper context. Right. And I, I think it all starts with a heart issue. Yeah. What is being said, mm -hmm. the tone in which it's being said, why it is being said, Yeah. whatever it may be, um, the heart behind it all. Yeah. It's really very revealing. Say it's like a, a confrontation. Now, if you go into something and you're like, well, I'm going to just hit them on the side of the head with a a Bible size two by four or whatever, um, you know, and I'm going to put them in their place. I've been wanting to do this. Then, you know, um, you are not approaching this situation right. in, in humility. Right. Um, but, or, um, you know, uh, gosh, there's just so many different, different scenarios that I can think of as far as, you know, confrontation, um, maybe having to say like a hard thing, you know, and instead of coming into it going, gosh, I've been just dying to put them in their place um, they've oh, needed Lord. to hear, yeah, they've <laughs> needed to hear this for so long. And finally, I'm going to get to say it, uh, uh, wrong heart, you know, but rather if you're coming to it, Lord, you know, um, grant me grace to say this clearly, um, you know, uh, prepare their heart, prepare my heart. Lord, if you don't want me to say this, would you, would you, um, guide me and speak to me? Um, show me to stop, you know, <laughs> or, or Lord, grant me the courage um, to be obedient. Uh, and we're going to get into courage next week, but grant me the courage to walk in obedience to what you've called me to do. That's a very different heart. Um, I also think about um, um, humility as far as taking bold steps, like uh, maybe even risks. And again, that's kind of getting into courage. We're getting into courage next week. And I guess it's already on my mind a bit, um, but to be able to have a boldness to try something different, um, to try something and fail, um, you know, and to not to not have to be a success right out of the gate. Um, I think that uh, that can be, you know, you you might look at that and go, oh, that was foolish, or that was, you know, um, going out unprepared or something like that. But to not be afraid to do those things, um, I think that there can be a certain humility in that as well. 
That all sounds good. <laughs> I kind of lose you on that one. <laughs> By the way, I took some homeopathy like right before we started this episode, and my headache is, I can move my head. Well, that is I'm really great. Pleased. I'm sure all of you have heard my voice. I'm getting over being Poor sick Deb. again. I know. I've got that that uh, crazy smoker voice, but <laughs> enduring through all of this. I told her she should record her voicemail when her voice sounds like this. It sounds so, I like it. Oh, boy. Anyways, yeah, this, is, this has been a really, yeah. honestly, every chapter of this book so far has been challenging. Uh, they all might seem a little bit um, like, oh, we could just power right through it and okay, on to the next one. But to really um, chew on these things, to ruminate on it and to consider, okay, how does this look with hands and feet? How do I live this out this week? Yeah. You know, I just, one thing, I just thank God. I thank Christ for his humility um, because without it, we're not saved without yeah, it. Pull that he gave us. Nothing. And, yeah. you know, I just encourage you guys to ask him to show you areas in your life where pride is keeping you from being obedient. Mm. Ask him to give you humility to follow Christ's example um, and move forward in that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that uh, we can be more deeply rooted, deeply rooted, growing more faithful fruitful and fearless together. Yes. Amen. Amen. Look forward to seeing y'all next week. Talking again next week. God bless you.